you very much, everyone. Um, just wanted to extend a big thanks to Dilip and Indu and everyone else for inviting me to be here today. Um, I'd like to make this as interactive as possible, so you should feel free to sort of ask questions throughout the session. I, I can't necessarily see everyone, but uh, if someone wants to walk around with the mic, that's great. And if you guys also want to ask questions towards the end, uh, that's fine as well. Uh, so I've left ample time for you guys to, to ask questions. Today, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the state and the future of the semantic web. Just a show of hands so I know how many people here know what the semantic web is. OK, good. So we'll do a little bit of background, too. I presume many of you have heard of the semantic web, even if you don't know what it is. Um, I like to call it Web Plumbing 101. The idea is that the semantic web really provides sort of an underlying structure for the web, provides a, much like plumbing does, sort of infrastructure in our own homes, the semantic web can provide that same kind of infrastructure for the way content moves around on the web. So basically, the semantic web is a decade-old vision that's been promoted by Sim, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who, as many of you may know, is basically the uh, founder of the web as we know it today. He's the person who conceived of the HTTP protocol and sort of laid the groundwork with a bunch of other very bright people for the web that we use today. Um, Around the same time, he and others, mostly in the academic circle, also conceived of a different kind of web called the semantic web. And the vision is pretty straightforward. Um, in the semantic web, unlike in the regular web, every website provides structured and semantically meaningful access to its content. So let's just understand what that means. Today, for those of you who know HTML, if you look at the HTML of a website, most of its instructions, most of its tags, refer to things like bold, colors, uh, sizes and location on the page. It's all for formatting. You'll never really see very much semantic information in the markup of a web page. And this is, you know, in part been because the web evolved in such a way that people needed to format data on the web for people to consume. So the web was really built up in such a way that it was meant for human consumption, not for computer consumption. All that your browser does with an HTML page is renders it on the screen. It doesn't understand what the web page is about. Um, so if you have a structured semantic layer underneath it, it's effectively like the web becomes a database. Um, let's, let's try and understand what that kind of structured access might mean. So instead of having tags like bold and paragraph, you might have tags like movie title or movie length. And these are things that would allow a computer to actually understand what the different content on a website is. So practically, and, and this is called the semantic web agent example, and this is sort of what the original framers of the semantic web used to explain their vision. So imagine you're, you're planning your family vacation. And you know, for those of you who have done this, you know that it involves a lot of logistics. You have to book a flight. You have to choose a location. You have to find dates that work for you. You might want to understand the weather in the different places. You need to sort of find something that's within your budget. You need to find a hotel that's appropriate. And in the semantic web, the vision of the agent is that if websites provided structured and meaningful access to their websites, your hotel website would be able to connect with your flight website, with your, your children's school's website, with your own calendar website, with the weather website, with your bank account to understand sort of your spending habits and what you could afford. And all together, you know, your agent could then come and present to you several options for your family vacation. It would be within your budget. It might even be to a place where it might be sunny when you can go. So this is a great vision, but I think that we all know that it's very far from the current reality of the web. Today, you're sort of left dealing with disparate content sources one at a time. So I think that we can all agree that outside of MIT labs and other academic environments, um, the semantic web has mostly failed. And it's really failed. So, so much so that when we were taking Dapper, and I'll tell you a little bit about the company soon, uh, on the roadshow for investors, Advisors around us said, you know what, you probably shouldn't bet your company's future on the notion of the semantic web. Not because you won't succeed, but because basically over the last 10 years, no one has really found a way to make money from the concept of the semantic web. And so its connotation is one of academia and one that doesn't really have any commercial prospects. So, you know, why? Why is it like this? this is, it holds great promise. Um, People have been talking about it for a long time. Clearly, the web and people using the web want this. So what happened? Turns out, really, it's not a technology issue. The technology to make the semantic web happen has existed for years. And, you know, XML, 
RDF, so on. People frame these technological uh, solutions a long time ago. So why is it that uh, it hasn't happened? Well, it turns out that it's really more of an economic issue. Um, it comes down to economic incentives. So in all honesty, people and, and companies are selfish, at least in economic terms. If something doesn't benefit them in the short term, they're unlikely to pursue it. Okay? And as it stands right now, making your website semantic web compliant doesn't have a lot of very immediate, attractive uh, benefits. Really what happens is, let's say you want to make your website semantic web compliant. That means you have to overhaul your technology so that instead of producing HTML, you, pr you produce semantically meaningful, structured access to your content, and then you render your website from that. And this, you know, if, you're, if you have a big enough website or so on, could involve a lot of IT resources, could take a lot of time, and there's no way to justify it with regard to the bottom line, because what happens when you do this? Now other people can come and use your content more easily. So that's nice, but how, how does that give you any sort of return on your investment? So effectively, that, that reason, the fact that there's a lack of economic incentives, is the one that I think, anyway, has prevented us from seeing this global semantic web come to pass until now. So it's clear that there's a change in the air. Uh, how many of you guys have heard of or use RSS? Okay, so that's a big portion of the audience. Um, basically, you know, over the, over the last year, RSS has sort of come into the mainstream, at least with sort of more savvy users. Now my, my father, for instance, who's not uh, a programmer or sort of a technologist by any means, he uses an RSS reader. A year ago, this was sort of almost unthinkable. Um, and we'll talk about why the feed, you know, RSS feeds and feeds in general promote the semantic web. Uh, during the last sort of two years, we've seen the rise of a number of really compelling companies. Uh, and what's sort of interesting about them is that they're building out the semantic web. And they might not necessarily say this, and, you know, bloggers might not necessarily notice this, but we can explore now why this is actually true. So these companies, and there's a lot more that I didn't manage to include in here. Uh, they span all the aspects of your day-to-day -day web life. Uh, let's talk about one company called Adaptive Blue. Adaptive Blue is sort of trying to change the way we navigate the web. In so much as today, when you navigate the web, all the links between websites are, for the most part, created manually by someone. So somebody says, this piece of content, I want to link out to it. It's related to my website in some way, and usually explains that relationship. Adaptive Blue is taking a different approach. They want to make the way you navigate between sites and between information on the web more fluid and more semantically meaningful. So let's say you are a blogger and you write about all sorts of topics, maybe your favorite music, your favorite uh, restaurants, and so on. You just embed this smart links code from Adaptive Blue into your website. And what ends up happening is that they sort of start to infer from your content its semantic meaning. So this is an example of, uh, this is a screenshot of what they put into one person's blog. It determines that Jack Johnson is a musician. And then it creates a link to Amazon and other sites that have more information about Jack Johnson, where you could buy his albums and so on. Now this is impressive, because if you look at the HTML of this website, nowhere will you see musician tag that says Jack Johnson. They've figured this out. And they've done this by sort of building an understanding of, uh, of these different terms, okay? So let's take another example. Um, Intel, of all companies, recently released a product called MashMaker. MashMaker is a very cool product. It sits inside your browser as a browser extension for Firefox or for Internet Explorer. And it allows you to bring content from one or more sources into a specific website. Now, this is only for your experience, and it's in the browser. Uh, so I'll give you an example that sort of can motivate it. I, uh, I do a lot of flying, and unfortunately, most of it is in the coach class. And even though I'm not the tallest person on the plane, I still prefer to find seats with extra leg room. Uh, so a big part of my, my process of booking flights is I'll go and I'll look for flights on my dates, and then I'll go off to another website like SeatGuru, and I'll investigate the different seats that are available on that particular type of plane for that particular airline. And I'll sort of flip back and forth and maybe choose my flights accordingly. For me, it would be really cool if I could just bring that information directly into the website as I'm browsing it. And MashMaker allows you to do that. So, and it does this by sort of allowing you to define this is a flight number, this is the plane model, this is the airline, and this is how you go get it from SeatGuru. 
Now, a, a lot of this is difficult to do and some of it requires programming, but the point is that they're trying to enrich your browsing experience so that it's more semantically meaningful, okay? The whole concept is that they understand what these different things are and therefore they allow you to sort of mix and match the data as you please. Okay, now, I, don't, I don't know if this is true in India, but in, in the Bay Area, people are pretty tired of hearing about Facebook, so often when I show this slide, people start to groan a little bit just because they've been seriously hyped. But I do want to take this moment to talk about something that's not immediately apparent. Facebook is effectively promoting the semantic web. Many of you may know about a year ago, they opened up their APIs to other outside application developers. And why, why does this have anything to do with semantic web? They're actually giving developers access to information like Joe likes the Beatles and Sarah likes the Beatles. And this is semantically meaningful because you've got people, you've got relationships, you've got uh, interests and likes, and you know that a certain thing is a musician, you know a certain thing is a place, you know a certain thing is a person. And this is much, much more structured and semantically meaningful information. And this is in large part why they've been so successful uh, with their application platform, because they've are given this kind of access to people to build around and build meaningful uh, services around. There's also Dapper, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, in a few minutes. Um, but I sort of wanted to address the fact that why am I talking about these different companies? What, what they have in common is that they're not sitting by idly, waiting for the semantic web to happen. They're going out and effectively building it for us. And if not the, the vision of the semantic web that people had sort of come up with 10 years ago, they're starting to build out the properties and services that we might want from the semantic web. And so many of them are also doing it from a user-generated perspective. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a moment. So let's just forget about, for one second, the, the notion of a perfectly clean and 100% correct semantic web um, and see how the road towards real-world web plumbing is being paved using existing practical techniques. So like I said, you know, during the Web 1.0 era, the semantic web was nothing more than a laboratory dream. But on the side, there was this uh, dark horse lurking, and it has taken us by storm, and it is the feed. So we've even got a couple format wars. There's RSS1, there's RSS2, there's Atom. But the notion of a simple structured feed has gone mainstream. Um, and it's giving us a lot of the properties we want from the semantic web. Today, most large and many small websites provide RSS feeds. And this gives you, as a programmer, uh, the ability to interact with the content in a different way through a program instead of with your eyes. Um, the problem is that RSS and, and these other formats are still really limited. They contain a very limited set of expressive semantics. They have title, date, and description, typically. And that's really all they provide. Now, this might work okay for a blog where that's you know, pretty much what you have, or for, maybe for a news site where it's relevant. Even there, it's not quite clear. Um, because your feed doesn't always necessarily provide the stories you want. For example, with the New York Times, they have a feed for all the major sections, world news, politics, national news, but they don't have an RSS feed for arbitrary searches. Let's say you want to be able to get an RSS feed of you know, news about Bangalore. Well, they don't necessarily have that. Um, so the, the idea is that there's even extensions to, our, to these feeds. Um, like Dig provides one. I don't know how many people are familiar with Dig. It's a social news site where you can vote stories up or down. And their feed also contains you know, how many people voted the story up and how many com comments there are. And they adhere to some sort of standards. But these, these extensions are really rare. And they're not adopted. And, and it's for the same reason that I mentioned earlier. There's just not a whole lot of incentive to pe for people to do this. There's, it's not even clear to many website owners why they're providing RSS feeds in the first place. And I'll go out and talk to content publishers and I'll say, you know, why do you provide an RSS feed? Like, well, you know, our users wanted it and, and it seemed like the right thing to do and our competitors are doing it. But the, they still don't see how they get, they get return from it and they're looking for solutions like FeedBurner that allow them to put advertising into their feeds in order to receive benefits from it. And so we're still in this sort of limbo state where the feed is a glimpse of what we might need but doesn't really provide the whole solution. No matter what, none of these feeds will give you that um, ideal vacation that we were talking about before. They just don't have that kind of expressive power and the ability to work together. Let's talk about a couple of the technologies that go sort of beyond feeds uh, and maybe at a deeper technology level. Um, they're born out of the practice that less is more. Keeping things simple is leading us towards the semantic web faster. And the original notion of the semantic web said, you know, you have to build RDF documents. RDF is a format of XML. You have to build OWLs. This is for 
making uh, ontologies of information. You have to do normalization and mappings of meanings. And creating these documents is tedious and difficult and requires a deep technical understanding. And that, that's sort of on the more side, right? So let's talk about different technologies that are being adopted in or recent years that are leading us towards the semantic web quicker. Um, one of them is REST. So REST versus SOAP. REST, for those of you who don't know, is a way of interacting with web-based services and feeds just by calling a URL. So it's very easy in almost any programming language to fetch a URL. Okay? And if you want to pass some sort of argument like, you know, search equals Bangalore, you just add it into the URL. This is in contrast to SOAP, right? which is a much more complex format. You also use a URL, but there you have to structure your request in the format of an XML block, post that to the server, get back an XML block, and you have a very tedious sort of communication. And this was one of the, the protocols that was originally proposed for use in the semantic web. So we see that by adopting REST, we're sort of moving that road forward, and it's making it very obvious that simplicity is critical for APIs if they're going to be adopted. Ajax, everybody you know, loves Ajax, even if they don't know what it means. Um, Ajax has got a number of properties that are leading it to be sort of leading us towards a semantic web. Um, specifically, there's three things. Ajax encourages people to separate form from content. And what does that mean? This sort of goes back to what I was talking about before. Uh, content on the web today is mixed in with the HTML. The HTML is for formatting and for form, and then there's the content inside, and they're fairly inseparable. Just by using Ajax, right, which is a technology that allows you to refresh portions of the page without the user having to relocate, it's a back end between your browser and the server, um, and it happens on the fly. Often responses to Ajax calls go from the server to the client in structured form, in XML or maybe in JSON. And this is already sort of one step towards separating out the content from the form. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but as they build Ajax websites, their, their site's already becoming more semantic web compliant. All they really have to do is expose those Ajax web services to the outside world, maybe with a little bit of documentation. And the only things that are really missing are all those things that the framers of semantic web had talked about, which is you know, mappings of meanings and normalization. For instance, maybe in one case you have, uh, you have you know, Boston, Massachusetts. In another case you have Boston. If you want to have sort of a common language, you need to normalize. Um, additionally, Ajax has been a big contributor to mashups in general. And mashups are sort of a, um, their proliferation of mashups is encouraging the semantic web because it encourages people to build APIs so that they can be used in mashups. And APIs are basically the building blocks of the semantic web. Finally, uh, microformats. Microformats is a pretty novel approach to um, inserting semantics into existing websites. And, and again, I don't know if the you know, people who build microformats, the people who use microformats, would think of it as a semantic web technology, but effectively it is. What microformats are is you embed inside the class attribute in HTML, which is typically reserved for CSS and for formatting your website, you can embed in there meaningful semantic names. So you could have a paragraph whose class is uh, musician biography. And that tells any computer program, you look for all the things that have the attribute musician biography, and then you know how to work with it. Um, there's even agreed upon standards for certain types of data, like addresses. So there's HCARD for address, and they use predefined class names. So this is really cool because it's a low effort approach. It doesn't require a lot of work in order to sort of set this up. And so these are some of the things that you know, have become available for website owners to easily add semantics into their website. But even though these relatively easy practices are becoming commonplace, it's clear that if we're going to sit around and wait for the semantic web to happen, even using these technologies, we're never really going to get to where we want to be, and it's going to take us forever to make any kind of progress. Well, let's keep exploring this notion. Um, in recent years, social bookmarking applications like Delicious and Flickr have given us the right tools using a community approach uh, to editing and tagging and metadata. And it's shown that it can be scalable and even accurate. Now, for those of you who don't know Delicious, Delicious is basically server-side bookmarks. You add a bookmark. And when you do, they encourage you to add tags. So you might say, you know, the Great Indian Developer Summit website is conference, India, Bangalore, uh, May 2008, right? And what's actually really interesting is you would think that as users add things without any sort of guidance, um, you'd end up with a big mess, right? People would just put in all sorts of garbage and you wouldn't be able to make sense of it. But actually, the contrary is true. It turns out that for the same website, many users use the same tags. And for different websites, they use similar tags as well. So 
you might label uh, the Great Indian Developer Summit a conference and Web 2.0 Summit a conference, and many users do those same things. And Delicious has done something that's really fascinating, right? Using their community, they've built up something that, if they had tried to do it using technology, would have been really hard, right? Let's say they had said, I'm going to crawl the web, find all the links on the web, and try to categorize them with tags. A lot of people have done this. They try to do content extraction, keyword analysis, uh, automatic classification. A lot of this stuff is done in academic research, and it never yields even close to as good results as you get with your user community. And you might think from the outset, ah, how are you really going to do this? How are you going to get enough users to go and do this in a meaningful way? And it turns out, and I'll show you how it's done with Dapper, that you don't even need that many users or that many bookmarks for it to be accurate and interesting. So what I'm trying to get at here is that one of the approaches that's become popular in the last few years is using your user community to help you do things that are otherwise very difficult. And it can be accurate and it can go fast, okay? So we'll get into how that's being used. So basically I'll talk a little bit about Dapper now. And again, I encourage you guys, feel free to interrupt me, just raise your hand and I hopefully I'll see you. Um, basically, we got frustrated with the fact that there's all these amazing things on the web but that they can't really talk to one another. That getting at their data is very difficult. And that sitting around hoping that someday somebody will make it so that I can get to that data is just a pipe dream. We'll never really get to real coverage of the web. So we went out and we set out to build Dapper. Our goal was to build a semantically meaningful layer over every single website. Okay, what that means is we want every website to have a feed, an API, that allows you to replicate any functionality that website has and extract any content that website delivers. Okay? This is a pretty bold goal. And the way we set about it was to say, let's use the user community because they have an incentive, right? Users say, okay, I need to use this website's content. How am I gonna do it? If you're a programmer, you might sit down and you might write a screen scraper and you might do all sorts of things that says, you know, give me the text that shows up after the third period on the 10th line and then tomorrow if that text gets longer and it's on the 11th line, your code starts to break. Other people who don't have the ability to write that kind of code are just lost. So we said, let's let our users in a non-programming, visual way, do this for themselves. Right? And that requires a pretty simple approach. Uh, and really the concept is they have the incentive. The content owner doesn't really have the incentive to put in any work. We did discover that over time that we made Dapper available and we made it available to content owners as well, they started using it. Not just content users, but the content owners themselves, because now it only takes them two, three minutes to create such a feed. Um, typically, I, I really breeze through this section and I even have slides for it, but I think a number of you are, are technical and I'd love to show you sort of more in depth. So if the internet will cooperate with me, I will try to do a demo here for you guys. Let's see what we got. Okay, I'm going to give you just sort of an example. I could create this on many different sites. The idea is, let's say, just take as an example, you want to build the next great search, right? But you don't really want to build search technology. You're not going to become Google, and you're not going to become Microsoft or Yahoo to do search. Instead, you have a really cool idea for an application. You want to search Google, Microsoft, Yahoo simultaneously. Maybe you'll also search Flickr and Amazon and a bunch of other sources. And your focus is to build this really cool app. Now, this is non-trivial to begin with. Uh, this is difficult to build. You have to think about your user interface. You might have to scale up your database. Think about how people are going to interact with your application. So the last thing you want to do is now go spend you know, the next six months of your life figuring out how to get the content out of these websites. Because that's just the part that, you know, to you, is an important part of getting the content in, but that's not really where you bring your value add, right? That's not something that you should have to worry about. So Dapper tries to extract all that away. So just as an example, let's say I'm going to make a feed for uh, MSN search, or live search as they call it now. The idea being, what I want is that I want to end up with a feed that takes an argument, whatever I feel like searching for, and returns me the results, the titles and the descriptions of all the search results. I don't want the ads, I don't want other stuff that's on that page, I want simple structured access to this website. You can imagine I could repeat this process for any other content source that I want to have. So, what I'm going to do, if I can find my cursor, is I'm going to type in I'm going to go to create a new DAP. Typically, what a user might do is he might just type in the URL of the website he wants to work with, and he'll find other DAPs. We call the APIs DAPs, but they're effectively feeds. And he would find things that other users have created. There's over 52,000 of these user-generated APIs on our site. And the only reason I'm showing you this is so that you can understand the process of creating one. Rest assured that with all the demos that we've done, there are many such feeds for MSN. So I'm going to type in 
search.msn.com. I hope people can see this. What's going to happen now is I'm going to go through a visual process of trying to teach Dapper what I want to have in my API. And this breaks down into two pieces, OK? The first piece is you have to show Dapper what the different, uh, how to get to the content. Now, for, for MSN search, this is pretty, uh, this is pretty trivial because their website's simple, right? You simply make a request to a web page and it returns the results. This gets much more complicated on a website like Orbitz, for instance, where you have a form and you fill in many values, it posts it to the server, and then it sends you to an interim page that sits there using JavaScript, pulling the server to find out if your search is ready, then it forwards you to another page with an identifier that the server then uses to fetch your results from the back end. So needless to say, this part is very, uh, very complex, and it's a big part of the technology that we've implemented. We support websites that require you to log in. We support dynamic HTML websites. There's a lot of stuff we don't support, and there's a lot of types of websites that have implemented things in such a way that our engine can't handle. But our goal is, of course, to eventually be able to handle more or less everything on the web. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach Dapper a little bit about this website. As you see, we've got the Dapper interface, and inside it, we have MSN Search. So we're basically browsing MSN Search through Dapper. And we've modified the page a little bit. As I hover over any input, I'm allowed to say that this input should be a variable for my feed. Okay, so I'll call it search terms. And what this means is that in the future, I'll be able to call my feed and pass it search terms. And Dapper will know whatever you pass, stick it in this box on the back end and replicate that user action, okay? It's actually kind of interesting. We'll, get, we'll see it again and again throughout the Dapper experience, but we're actually even defining semantics here. Nowhere on this page, around this box, does it say search terms. Now, I've taught Dapper that this box on this page is somewhere where you put in search terms. And that's already pretty meaningful semantically. Okay. So I'm going to do a couple searches. I'm going to start with cats. It makes absolutely no difference what I search for. Okay. The point is I need to train Dapper. I need to show it pages that have this structure, a template, if you will. Right. So pretty much every search on MSN looks the same. Maybe some don't have the images. Maybe some don't have the related searches, but by and large, the structure is the same. I need to give it a couple examples. It doesn't matter what I give it. It's irrelevant. In the future, it will work on all different searches. That said, it has to be a page with this structure. You can't then expect this API to work on you know, MSN image search, because that page looks completely different and doesn't have the same semantics either. Okay? So I did cats. I'm going to add it to my basket. Now, in general, it's good to add more than one page. And why is that? Because then Dapper can say, OK, well, these two pages have the same HTML structure, more or less. And it can find similar patterns between the pages. And it uses that to understand what content is static and what content is dynamic. Typically, you're only interested in the dynamic st uh, content. That's exactly what an API delivers, right? If the content was static, you wouldn't need to fetch it every day, right? Or every hour, every minute. You could just copy and paste it to wherever you need to use it. So it's the fact that the content's changing. Now, Let's just do another search. It really doesn't matter again what I do. I'll type in dogs. We'll add that to our basket. Now, Dapper does work on pages on just a single example. For instance, the New York Times only has one homepage. There's no other page on their website that looks like the New York Times homepage. And so Dapper is designed to work with that as well. OK, so now that I've given them a couple examples of pages with the same structure, I'll be able to go in and tell it what content I want it to extract. I've now defined how I get to the pages, what inputs it might require, and now I'm going to say what content I want to get out of it. Excuse me while the internet loads this, bringing all the bits over from California. Um, this process is a very subtle but important part of our grassroots semantic effort. And I'll show you what I mean. A couple of things that are going to be really interesting now. So you see that the, we've changed the interface such that you can Highlight different portions of the page. Okay? I clicked one of the titles, and you'll see, if you can see down here at the bottom, that it's extracted all the titles. It's also highlighted them. I hope you can see that color. Now, there's a couple of interesting things going on here. The first is it got all the titles. Right? This isn't just so that you don't have to click all those things. This is a real deep reflection of the technology. What's going on is that we've understood, our algorithms have understood, these titles belong to a class. And we don't know what this class is. And we don't even know if this class interests you. Okay? But we do know that they belong to a class. Okay? And that's important. Because if you look at the HTML, the only discerning characteristic of that link is that it's a link. And if you look at the HTML, there's no difference between that link and this link, or this link, or this link, 
or this link. They're all the same size, they're all links, they're all the same color. There's very little we can infer just from the HTML that, uh, you know, at least in a simple way, that would tell us these things are different than these things, okay? You know, the, the HTML just says put this here, put this there. So the Dapper technology, and I'll be happy to field questions about this at the end, uses a whole set of algorithms that says, I need to make a mapping between this mess that is the HTML and what a user might see when he sees the web page. You look at this and immediately you say, okay, this is a bunch of search results. Each search result has a title, a description, there's a link to the cached page, there's the URL. A computer looks at it and he says link, paragraph, link, paragraph, and it means nothing. You, you see it, right? And so that's what Dapper is trying to do, is make this mapping. Now, I'll, I'll be honest, I chose a great site that's you know, well-structured and Dapper works very nice on it. I don't like to demo Dapper where it doesn't work, right? Um, but Dapper supports this sort of inherent learning. Let's say, let's just say that Dapper had not been able to determine that this is of a different class immediately. And let's say it had selected it. Well, then all you would need to do is unclick it. You just click it again, and Dapper says, oh, so you want this cross-section of this cross-section. You just keep clicking until you get the right combination of things. And that's also a big, powerful part of the way Dapper works. Because we don't want to have all sorts of switches and levers and make your, your experience complicated. The idea should be, you click, you tell us what you want, and in the end, we'll figure it out. We'll figure out what these different algorithms need to do in order to get you what you're looking for. It's not quite machine learning, but it's adaptive understanding of what you want. Okay. Let's do something interesting now, okay? Let's save this. I'm going to call this a search result title, okay? This, I'm just going to take this, uh, this moment to point something out. This is a process that users never think twice about. And this is great. This is what we've seen from our analytics. And that's how we want it to be, right? We don't want people to sit here and say, well, what's going on? You know, how do I name this? Um, but this is really cool because this is building the semantic web. I've now come and said for this web page, this link, this thing, is a search result title. Nowhere on the page does it say search result title. And this is how we're harnessing the user community. They are describing the properties of this web page to us, the semantics of this web page. And why is that important? Because I, I don't know any semantic technology that I could build, any algor algorithms that I could build that would reliably, as reliably as a user, tell me that this is a search result title. Okay, so using the same concept that Delicious and Flickr and others have used, we're letting the people who have an incentive do this work. And as you can see, it's a trivial amount of work. It's typing in a name. It's something they feel they need to do anyway, right? You're building an API. You're going to be using it in your code. The thing needs to have a meaningful name so that you'll remember what it is. You have one purpose for doing it. Our purpose for you doing it is so that we understand the semantics of this website. So this is very interesting, right? You have an incentive to do it, and sort of the end result is that we build up the semantic web. Now let's create another field. Uh, let's get the description. We'll do the same process. Search result description. Okay. So whatever. I could also extract the ads if I wanted or related searches, but let's just for the sake of simplicity stick with that. So now you're given the opportunity to preview and make sure that this API is actually getting the content that you want. Okay? So you're still left with an interesting thing. XML doesn't guarantee order of anything. So you have no idea which title is related to which description. Let me put a disclaimer here. Many APIs use a whole lot of structure. You might say, this is a person. And these are his names. And then under that you might say, this is his first name and his surname. And then you might have addresses, and then address, and then street inside there. We only really allow one level of nesting. And this is not because there's anything wrong with the more complex structure, but this is more simple. It's easier for people to understand. Yeah, I've been giving you guys a lot of background on Dapper as we go through it. We understand most users come to Dapper, and they have some very specific need. Maybe they're a developer, they need to create an API. Maybe there's somebody who read about us and heard that you can make a Facebook app using Dapper in two minutes. Maybe there's somebody who wants to create an RSS feed. Everybody has his own unique needs. They don't necessarily want to know and understand what all this means. So you have maybe four seconds to explain to this person what Dapper is and what it should do for them. It's very, very difficult to do with something like this because Dapper is unique. If you have a video search engine, for instance, people understand the concept you search, you get videos, right? You don't have to teach them. With Dapper, you have to teach them. So a big part of our user experience is focused around keeping things simple. So that's why there's only one level of structure. However, it's already pretty meaningful. I can group different fields together and add yet another layer of semantics. So now I know that those two things together are a search result. So that's an actual, yet another piece of semantics about the page. OK, so I'll call this MSN search GIDS. 
And there's a bunch of stuff you can put in here, like description and tags. This is to make it easier for other users to find what you've built. Um, you see here that it says that it accepts input variables, search terms. And down here, there's a bunch of options. You can make it private, for instance, so that no one else can find it. I find it pretty interesting that about 35% of the 52,000 dApps are private. Um, I find it interesting only because it really wouldn't require very much work for anybody else to go create it. So just a reflection of human nature that people like to sort of keep what they're doing to themselves, at least in about a third of the cases. There's other options like saying only include full groups. So for instance, you may never want your API to return a result that has only a title but no description. That's just according to the logic that you're using and whatever you're using your API for. And that was just something that was requested a lot. I'm going to market a test app, which basically means that within 24 hours it'll get deleted. This feature exists because people are learning Dapper and they're creating things that they don't plan to keep using. And it allows us to keep things a little bit cleaner. So I'm going to show you a little bit here, and we can come back to this later if you guys want, because um, I won't dive too in depth. This is what we call the Dapp page, the how to use page. This is effectively a way to understand how to use this API that you created using Dapper. Um, on the left, eventually, the screenshot will appear showing you which content is extracted. And here you see a bunch of ways you can use your DAP. You could consume it in XML. All of these other formats, XML is our core format. That's how we output it, and I'll show you what it looks like. All these other formats are called transformers. They transform according to some set of rules, the XML into some other format. Uh, this is um, open source, so a lot of these transformers have been contributed by the community. And it's nice, because Rather than you having to say, well, I have the Dapper XML now and I want to make an RSS feed, so I have to write some code that transforms it from XML into RSS, you actually have it done for you. So a lot of the common tasks have been, uh, have been preserved. So let's take a look at what the XML looks like. OK. So you see, this is for the default search, which was the first one that we did, cats. And you'll see that it has search results, search result title, search result description. So instead of, and let's look at what the XML, what the HTML looks like for the same result. I'm going to type in cats. And we can look at the HTML of the search result. This is what that looks like. I don't know what you can really do with this. But with this, back here, you can actually parse this out, use it in some meaningful way. And you now have structured access. And it will work on any search. And I just supply the search in REST form inside the URL. So I type Bangalore, and I'll get XML that did the search on Bangalore. And you'll see the first result here is Bangalore Wikipedia and Bangalore.com and so on. So as you see, you can now bring in MSN search results into anything you're building. If you're a developer, you can bring it into your app, be it a web app, a desktop app, a physical device. People have built set-top boxes that sit on top of your television and bring you information from the internet. People have built desktop apps that help you search for various things on the web. And many people have built web-based things as well. OK, so if you're not a developer, you may choose to do one of many other things. Get a Flash widget, consume it in RSS, make a Google gadget. Sort of the, the opportunities are limitless there. And we listen often to our users. And because this is open source, many people contribute new output formats all the time. OK, so this, I think, gives a pretty decent overview of Dapper. Uh, I'd be happy to field questions at the end of the talk about how it, um, oh yeah, sure. Uh, do you handle the same duplicate data on the same thing by JavaScript? Yes, so the question is, do we handle content that's gener generated at runtime by JavaScript? And the answer is yes. It took us a long time to get there. It's really hard. Because if you, you for instance, fetch the HTML of that website, you won't see that in there, because it's generated by JavaScript at runtime. So what we actually do is, on the back end, in Java, we execute the JavaScript. We interpret and execute the JavaScript. So we first load up the HTML, create a document object model representation of it. Then we run all the JavaScript as if we were your browser. And in fact, we use Mozilla projects for this. So we use the Gecko engine to parse the HTML. We use Mozilla's Rhino to interpret the JavaScript. And then we make the changes to the HTML on the fly using the JavaScript that was run. And then we extract the content. So yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So let's discuss that. That's one of the most frequent questions. We handle them in a number of ways. First of all, we use a whole set of algorithms. The question, by the way, for those of you who didn't hear, was how well does it handle changes to the website? So changes to the website come in many different forms, right? 
Um, some things you, you don't necessarily call changes, but they're actually things you have to deal with. For instance, on the search for cats, there may be related, related searches. But if you search for some arcane thing that nobody's ever heard of, there are no related searches. So that in Dapper size is actually a change to the website because the structure of the HTML is a little different. There's this whole element with many sub-elements missing from the page. So Dapper was specifically designed to handle those kinds of permutations. We do that by using a whole set of algorithms, not just one, that look at many different things. We do look at the CSS class. We do look at XPath. We also look at localized substructures of the HTML DOM. Okay? So we say, there's a, a div, and it contains between two and eight paragraph tags. Each one of those may or may not contain a bold tag, uh, and it's at most four levels deep from some, from some paragraph who has a third cousin who is so on and so forth. So these algorithms take lots of localized substructures into account. So that said, you know, this handles almost all cases of permutations and minor updates to websites. Turns out you know, website owners love to overhaul their websites. It happens a lot more frequently than you might think. Um, and the, that, that at the end of the day, you know, all of those localized substructures will be gone and we won't be able to identify anything anymore. So until recently, the way we dealt with that was we just very carefully monitored automatically the output of our XML. And if the, if the XML started deteriorating, if we started not including as many results, we would alert the person who created it by email and say, hey, look, you might want to look into this. It seems to be deteriorating. Um, that's not great <laughs> because you, know, you might not be paying attention. You may not have given us a real email address. Uh, anyway, it's stressful, right, because your app might start breaking all of a sudden. So how do we deal with it now? The idea is that there's a number of ways you can automatically uh, adjust for this. It's not 100%, but there's two sort of main methods that we automatically correct dApps with. One is using content. Take Amazon, for example. Amazon has book pages. The book page says this is Thomas Friedman is the author. Um, the book name is The uh, World is Flat. There's an ISBN, there's a price, and so on. Now, tomorrow they may completely overhaul their website, but the name of the book hasn't changed, and the name of the author hasn't changed. So we can just fetch up that page, rerun our analysis. Yesterday, the thing that the user called book title was ABC. Today, that same content appears in something we call DEF. So we say, now, book title is DEF instead of ABC. So content is one way. Structure is another way. Let's say you take MSN search results. Cats returns 10 results. Dogs returns 10 results. Tomorrow, they completely overhaul their website there's still going to be 10 results there, right? They might have completely different text, right? Because you know, web results change all the time. Um, but what ends up happening is you have a similarity in structural integrity, right? So you, you have some 10 things. They might have a completely different structure, but these 10 things repeat and have the same relationships with one another, OK? They are, you know, exist at the same level in the DOM. They have a certain level of complexity. They always contain a link, and so on. So that's, uh, that, that's how we contend with changes to the website. They just told me we have about 10 minutes left. What I want to do is I'll go through the rest of the presentation, and I'll be happy to continue answering questions about Dapper. And I saw some more hands, so we'll get back to it in just a second. I just want to make sure we have enough time. And also, for those of you uh, who want later in the afternoon, I'm talking about another aspect of Dapper, and that could give you another opportunity to hear some more. So I'm going to go through these slides. This is typically the slides that I show rather than demo Dapper. Um, this just shows you the many different ways in which we allow the content to be used widgets and Facebook apps and so on, iPhone apps. We actually have an iPhone transformer as well. Uh, OK, so let's talk about the future. I think that you know, just from the questions, we see that this is pretty exciting, right? Semantic web opens up a lot of opportunities for us, and things are, uh, are very exciting in this space. So what, what does the, uh, the future hold? Let's just first say what it probably doesn't hold. I contend, anyway, that we're not going to see the semantic web be adopted in the way that it was envisioned with RDF and OWL and these complex semantic no technologies. Um, and that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay? It's just, I think that's the reality. What we are going to see is a lot of companies like Dapper and Adaptive Blue and you know, other companies out there, Intel's MashMaker, sort of contending with the web. They say, listen, the web's not perfect. There's not much we can do about that. Okay? So let's just try to deal with the world as it is and still deliver products instead of crying and going home and saying we can't do it, right? Um, a lot of it's going to be motivated by user-generated aspects, like I showed you with Dapper and like you'll see with many other products out there. Um, let's talk about some practical implications, and I'll sort of try to go through this so we can cover it all. Advertising. You know, a bunch of you are probably rolling your eyes because, like me, you probably hate ads. Many of you probably have ad blockers installed. Ads today are not fun. They're pretty useless to most of us. Um, 
And let's just talk about the two kinds of ads that really exist today. There's brand ads, which are often graphical and animated, and maybe highly relevant um, you know, to the content, but are not very interesting. And then there's uh, direct response ads, which often use keyword analysis to figure out what a page is about, and then target related ads. So let's take a recipe page from a site like allrecipes.com. Uh, the recipe page today, maybe, I don't know if you guys have this in India. In the United States, there's all sorts of services where you can order groceries online. One of the biggest companies is called NetGrocer. So um, basically, NetGrocer today might advertise on a recipe website. It might be a really beautiful ad with a shopping cart zooming in from the side. It says, you know, buy your groceries online, save yourself some time, whatever. Other, other ads might be, you know, hey, this is a chocolate cake recipe, so I'll give you chocolate lover recipe advertisement. What Semantic Web could do for a website like this is assume you have a feed for the recipe page that gives you ingredients. It gives you all sorts of other stuff, but the ingredients is interesting. And then assume you have a feed for NetGrocer that allows you to search for a product or an ingredient, and it brings back results with prices and images and product names. Now, the kind of ad you can deliver here is one that says, on the fly, I know what page I'm on. I'm going to extract the ingredient names. I'm going to conduct a search using my feed at NetGrocer and bring back matching products. So for those of you who can't see, this ad shows all of the ingredients for this recipe. And then it shows how much the ingredients cost, and you can just click to buy it. So really, this sort of starts to move ads to the point where they become a feature of the publisher's website. Advertising doesn't have to be a dirty word, right? It's just that today it's fairly useless. If you apply semantic technology to it, you really start to see that ads are a very, very useful mechanism for moving content around the web. It's amazing, right? Because on the one hand, many content owners say, hey, you know, I don't want my content to go leave my website. I don't know how I'm going to make money off of it. On the other hand, you walk in and you say, hey, pay me money. I'll make an ad using your content, and it will be great. And they say, great, I'll pay lots of money. So the, the advertising realm is sort of ripe for this. And Dapper has released something called Mashup Ads. And uh, I can discuss this a little bit more both offline with anybody who's interested and also later at my other sessions. OK. And just to use the last few minutes, um, meaningful search. The semantic web, probably the holy grail is search. Okay? Um, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And we're seeing it in many forms. If you guys have used Kayak or other sort of search engines for travel, you'll notice that they let you do things like filter by date or filter by airline and so on. And this is effectively semantic search, but it's highly limited to one category. And the reason is because they put everything in a database, and then you can sort of work with that database directly. Um, so the, the, let's, let's show you a demo, because I think this will get the point across better. Um, OK, so just before I show you this, the disclaimer, this is a demo search engine that was built just to be shown at events like this. It's not a real search engine. Um, it's highly limited. But I wanted to convey the power of semantic search. So just so that you understand how it works, uh, inside the index are recipes, restaurants, like sporting statistics, and um, events. OK? So let's type in chocolate. Just so that you know how this works. Oh. Let's try it this way. Right. Coffee. OK, so it looks like a search engine page. On the right hand side, you have a bunch of results. You see one is Mocha Coffee Mix, which is an, a recipe. We see one is Chicago Open Coffee Club, which is an event. And that part looks a lot like a, a regular search engine. It's a little different in that you can see real semantics. So you see that we've got ingredient, 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 cook time, and so on. And on the side, you can drill down. So you can drill down by city or by the amount of time it takes to cook and so on. So let's say that we want to prepare some sort of chocolate dessert tonight. So we want a recipe. Now I searched for chocolate. On the left-hand side, I also see that we've got state and city. So it looks like we're getting events in there as well. So I could do something like type in ingredient chocolate, and we end up with only things that have an ingredient that's chocolate. Now, this is probably, in our case, only recipes, but it could be broader than that. Now let's say, um, let's try and do something that's really, uh, really tough to do with a regular search engine. And this you could do with Google, right? You type in chocolate recipe and you get some results anyway. But let's say that I'm on a diet and I only want recipes that have 0 to 200 calories in them. 
If I typed in calories, zero to 200, I don't know how you could ever tell Google to do something like that. The best you could do is say low calories. And you see it filtered the results down. Let's say I'm really, really lazy and I don't like cooking, so I want to click on the left where it says cook time two minutes, and I end up with one recipe and I know what to do. And this is the kind of thing that is really, really hard to do on the whole scale of the web. You could go and build a vertical search engine, like many people have done with travel, um, and you'd have to sort of ingest it and put it in a database and write all sorts of code for it. But this really has promise for the whole web, and it would make finding information a lot easier. And it's just one example of how semantic search is being deployed. I encourage those of you, we we're sort of out of time, but I encourage those of you who are interested in this to check out, about two, three months ago, Yahoo made an announcement that they will support people who add semantics to their website. They will support indexing that and allowing people to search semantically. And we released a product called Semantify that helps you make your website semantic compliant for Yahoo's crawling. So all of these things I'll be happy to talk to. I don't know if we have any time for questions. Um, do we have any time? Yeah, okay, so it looks like we have some time for a few questions. Um, be happy to, to field them. I know there's a few more, especially about Dapper. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, here's what the way this search engine was built, right? We built DAPs, APIs, for those sites, okay? And then we indexed the output of those DAPs. We crawled the website using the DAP, okay? And so in this case, yes, it, you need to have structured access before you can search in that way. Yeah, in order to actually execute this fully across the web, you would need to have a feed for every website. And so there's things you can do using Dapper as well, and we can talk about that offline if you want, for creating a feed for every website, even without a user's involvement. Yes? Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, in, in that kind of environment, you know, I presume that what they did in their app, the question was how will this work sort of in a rich internet application environment, and he mentioned, uh, mentioned Adobe's Air application, I believe, for eBay. I presume that they used eBay's API, right? eBay has a very rich API, as do many e-commerce websites, okay? And that's part of what makes that possible, right? So this plays out in the fact that if you want to continue to be able to build alternate interfaces, be they air interfaces or mobile interfaces or whatever, to a website, you need to have structured access. And using Dapper or creating feeds in any way that you can is one way to get there. Okay. Yes? Are there any cross-domain specific problems? Um, well, it, you know, the, the only problems that we encountered were sort of in our interface. There's no real cross-domain problem because our server talks to a specific domain and it thinks that we're just another browser. Right? So we interact with the website as a browser. Sometimes we have problems because we are you know, trying to do things across domains, but that's sort of solved within our own code. Yes? Your vision is to uh, let the users define the metadata for different sites and let them do Yes. Yeah, the, the question is, the vision is to allow users to define the metadata for different sites. And the answer is yes. We want the users to be able to create the semantic web for themselves. Yes? Uh, that's a great question. The question is, can you give us some examples of the aggregated semantic information that we've been able to extract? Um, some, some very interesting things. It turns out that with this sort of semantic network, you can uh, build out uh, normalization schemes. That's one example. So for instance, we have a user who creates a, um, we have many users who create like a concert listing feed. And some users call uh, the place where it happens location, and some people call it venue. Okay. So with enough examples within the semantic network, we can actually say venue and location are the same thing. So that's one result of the semantic network that emerges. Uh, other relationships are even more interesting, right? Not just in the semantic naming, but also in the values. For instance, I can tell you, well, you know, here are all the venues that we see, right? Here, these two things are clearly related to one another. These two websites, which you would have no idea are related to one another based upon their names or their domains or anything like that. For instance, Classical music uh, listings of concerts versus you know, rock shows. Right? I can tell you these two websites are related, if only because they have shared semantics. Somebody said venue on this page, and somebody said venue on this page. So 
So semantic network actually reveals a lot of interesting things, and we've only started to scratch the surface. I think we have one minute left, so I'll take another question. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a, that's a great lead-in question. This afternoon's session is uh, about Dapper's mashup framework that allows you to take multiple dApps and other web services and APIs and combine them together. So what I showed you was creating one feed. The real question is, now that you have that one feed, what comes next? How do you use it? How do you build a mashup? How do you build an application that uses content from more than one source? So I'd be happy to see all of you guys later this afternoon. We have maybe 30 seconds. I think we're done. Okay. Thank you guys very much.